Thursday, you should come see it. I'll call the order of the City Council work session for City of East Grand Forks, Tuesday, October 12th, 2021. It is now 5 o'clock. City Clerk, please call roll. Mayor C. Andrews? Here. Council President Mark Wolfman? Here. Council Vice President Tim Here. 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 Present. Brian Larson. Does term quorum. Um, number one, request to prepare report of feasibility for 20th Street Northwest and 5th Avenue Northwest. Mr. Emery. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, Council. Um, so in 2019, we had completed a report of feasibility for utility and street reconstruction on 5th and 20th Street Northwest. Um, <laughs> I guess just, you know, kind of discussions with the mayor and stuff too, trying to move that project forward somewhat if we can. So, um, you know, my thought was if that project moved forward, it's going to be an assessment project. So, you know, as part of the assessment process, really the first step is to complete the reporting feasibility, which I guess at this time we'd probably be just updating what we had from 2019. Um, filing that with you and then potentially moving ahead with uh, an improvement hearing with the residents and just you know seeing at that time uh, you know if they want to move forward with the project or you know what that project would entail so so I guess at this time really just um, again bringing it forward just looking to get authorization to move ahead with the report of feasibility anybody has any questions for Mr. Emery Mr. Vetter but this hasn't come from the citizens then? No, at this time it's it's really, um, you know, the mayor asking to kind of move it forward. And, and I'm, I'm kind of at the point where we've brought this forward a number of times and they've kept voting it down. I'm not willing to bring it forward anymore unless they come to us first. So I would vote no on this if it would, came before us. Thank you. Mayor. Um, nobody's voted it down. Um, what we're waiting for is a package that we can put together that they will actually come through a process of filling out the um, the role to, to bring it to us. And nobody's done that yet. So they'd have to walk it around and get the signatures that they need and bring it in. And um, so far they haven't seen a package that worked well. As a matter of fact, we had a meeting with them right before COVID hit. And coming out of that meeting, we all agreed that we, the city, would do certain things and bring it back to them for them to make a more informed choice. And then we were never able to bring it because of COVID. So really, the last time we met with them, the ball was in our court to clean up what we were bringing and give them some options that they could then petition the neighborhood and then bring it in to us. And uh, so really, we're, uh, we're stepping in where we left off before COVID hit and just continuing on from there. I think the thought was a little bit as I mean we could have moved ahead and just had another neighborhood meeting but as part of the process we need to potentially do an improvement hearing regardless so our thought was let's just kind of go through this process instead of hold, holding our resident meeting and then two months later now we got to do the improvement hearings so we're kind of trying to kill two birds with one stone here too so and Bill said Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, wondering what the cost is if it's mostly just an update to the the 2019 report. And we don't charge anything for the report of feasibility. Okay, just want to make sure. And then, is there what specs are going to be used for that road? That I mean. Is it going to be, are you going to have multiple set specs for that? Or, I mean, are you going to give them reports based on different options? Or have we decided on an option? Or you want me to, to yeah. respond? Um, all the recommendation from staff all the time has been a complete reconstruction with concrete. Um, anything less than that would be um, really compromising the long-term durability. And it's very possible that with that level of reconstruction, um, we can get the work also, some of the water main work done and, and just package it all together. If it were a, a lesser project than that, such as a, a full replacement with asphalt or a partial replacement, um, then the cooperation of water and light would be less because it would be an easy surface to pick up or patch. And so they feel, and again, it's all pending the, the approval of the commission 
This is all for discussion. Um, so it's likely to be brought a few different ways, giving the residents some options. We really don't want to have to go back and do, oh, hey, do this, do that, do some more homework. So we're going to try to come to the next meeting fully prepared um, with a few options, but making it clear that full street replacement with concrete is the recommended option. Um, and if that turns out to be untenable to the residents financially, only then would we consider a, a less durable, less expensive outcome. I think one of the things we have to remember too, though, is I know we talked about the options, Mayor. I think giving them more than two options, you know, one with the full reconstruction with concrete and the other one with asphalt, I think that just keeps pushing everything down the road, kicking the can, and it's going to actually end up costing them more if something does happen that needs to be replaced. So I think we need to make sure that they're well aware of, even though, let's say, you want to take the easy route and go to the cheaper route, it, in the long run, it's going to cost you more money. I think uh, that's an important part of our presentation, Ms. President, for sure. Mr. Riopelle. From what I heard at that last meeting is they understand the fact that they need to have the road done. They're just looking for what it's going to cost. I think this is going to help us to give them that and let, let them make a, their own decision. So I think it's a good thing. Anybody else say anything? Was, or just, was the fifth portion of that, wasn't that, isn't that an asphalt street? Fifth right now is asphalt. And you'd be upgrading to concrete? Yeah. We, we would Are look, we going to do We would probably that? look at the options, upgrading to full <coughs> concrete, upgrading to full, you know, basically a full bituminous reconstruction. I think it's probably the two options we'd want to start with, I think. Is asphalt. Is it? It's all asphalt. I think it's all asphalt. I mean, you're up there. It's all from 17th North. It? It's all asphalt. So there'll wow, be a really nice. You got some concrete way, hatches in there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering. I mean, if that's going to be, if we're going to go from, if there are asphalt streets that we're going to recommend going to concrete, is that going to be the policy going forward? I don't have a. I think that's our first priority. Is we would like to definitely see it go to concrete. But really, they'll petition. And that's what starts this whole thing. You know, if we wonder why this street hasn't been done, I'm sorry, Mr. President, if we wonder why it hasn't been done in the last 30 years when we've known that it was ready to be replaced, the answer is we're waiting for the residents to petition to have it done. That's what starts the whole process. But of course, they didn't know what they were asking for because they didn't have any idea what the cost would be. So we've taken it to that extent. And now they can petition really knowing what they're getting into. I'll just restate that having critical infrastructure in the city dependent on the, the ability for certain people to pay for it is not a great long-term plan for the city. Thank you. Can else have anything? See none, sir. Thank you. Number two, consider applying for the Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Grant Program. Mr. Emery. So this spring, um, kind of right before school got out, we uh, um, kind of, us in conjunction with Alliant Engineering, completed a uh, signal warrant analysis at the intersection of Bigland and 13th. Um, our role in it is we basically, with Seth, we completed the pedestrian counts um, and then also completed uh, traffic counts there. And then Alliant Engineering basically analyzed that information. Um, and basically what they, you know, what they found, because again, the question has always been, would this intersection qualify for traffic signals? Um, so in that analysis, basically um, there's nine different warrants that you look at for justification of traffic lights. Um, the report came back, um, one of the nine warrants were met um, to qualify for traffic lights there. And that warrant was basically for a, you know, like a school crossing warrant or whatever. Um, 
So we've we've discussed it kind of with Alliant and um, MnDOT, and basically what MnDOT has came back and said is they would allow the city to utilize your state aid dollars if you wanted to put a traffic light at that intersection. Um, they also said that if it, if this road was on a trunk highway, MnDOT would never approve traffic lights at that signal based on only one warrant being met. So, um, and then with that, also talking to, you know, Alliant Engineering, um, you know, their feeling too was that, you know, given the pedestrian issues, the traffic counts at this intersection, they felt that traffic lights may not be the best justification. So with that being said, um, you know, we've talked in the past about the potential of a Hawk system installed there, basically, which is a pedestrian crossing system that once that system is activated, you basically get red lights, almost just like a regular traffic signal that's going to stop the traffic as opposed to just like the flashing system we have out there now that yes, it warns the pedestrians, but it really doesn't necessarily stop the traffic. So, so with that, um, you know, MnDOT's currently taking applications um, through their Safe Route to School infrastructure program. And I just thought maybe that, you know, with your authorization, you know, maybe we could look at applying to install a Hawk system at this intersection. Um, the Safe Routes School program does provide funding for up to 100% of the eligible construction costs. You know, the city would be responsible still for engineering any of those soft costs. Um, and basically this program right now, they're looking for, you know, these funds, if you're awarded it, they would like these funds spent in either construction year 2022 or 2023. So. Again, just thought, you know, potentially a good project, um, you know, if you guys want us to apply for it. So I guess with that, we can open it up to questions too. I think it's a great idea. We do anything we can out there, especially on that corner for safety of our kids. I know that system we have there now, um, I've been down there numerous times where people are crossing and not pushing that button. But I think with the Hawk system, I'm, would probably be better. It'd be nice to be able to do a traffic signal, but there's a warrant uh, having that there for those time periods in the morning, time period in the afternoon. I don't know. But I think we need to do whatever we can. And again, the Hawk system, kind of like the system we got now, I mean, yes, the pedestrians still got to activate it, you know, which <laughs> kind of a learning curve there to teach the, you know, the pedestrians to make sure they activate the system. But, right. but ultimately, I mean, this one will stop it. MnDOT did say the best system, the safest system is crossing guards, but I think that's been discussed in the past too, and we haven't seemed to get any traction with getting crossing guards out there either, so. Better's looking for a job after retirement, right? <laughs> Mayor. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, thanks, Mr. Emery. And I do agree that under the circumstances of the nine uh, ways to possibly change the flow at that intersection. The one that met their warrant happened to be the pedestrian one, and it probably would be a stretch to put in a full signalized intersection there, which again, I would prefer. But if all of the experts say it would be beyond what is still warranted there, then I think this is really the best outcome that we could hope for. And if we could get it funded, that would be, of course, a huge help from uh, these safe route to school dollars. Um, however, you know, and I've always said in the last couple of years, the number one concern along Bigland is pedestrian safety at 13th over and above any other concern on that corridor in the, in the immediate need that is there. It is pedestrian safety. Talking to families that live near there, they say there's a close call there almost every day between a car and a kid in the spring and in the fall where a lot of kids are walking and biking to school. Some have said, I can't even look out the window. It, it just makes me crazy to see what's happening there. And I know our, our police have gone out and, and worked that intersection best they can during those peak times. 
but even then we have no one else on patrol if there would be an emergency elsewhere so that is not a long-term solution even for half an hour twice a day we do need to do better than than what we have um, the one thing this would leave unanswered then is the vehicular access question um, onto Bigland Road, particularly in the morning, particularly from the west. And so we'll have to look at that, you know, as a future item, really with some renewed interest. Um, but if we got this done, if we got a Hawk system there, it would be very, very good. And I, I mean, peace of mind for all of us that we're doing the right thing for our kids. Anybody else have anything, Mr. Demers? Thank you, Mr. President. Do we have an estimate what uh, one of those systems would cost? That's something I'll be working on, but you know, rough numbers. I'm thinking we're probably in that 250 to 300 thousand is kind of what I've kind of been initially told. And it would just be linked on two in two directions. It wouldn't be a four-way system. Two. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. I. I mean. As has been said, it is a problem. Primarily, there's a pedestrian problem. Secondarily, there's a pretty bad traffic flow problem there. Um, I think if we look at this, though, we know right now in the you know in the long range Bigland study, it does come for call for a roundabout in that location. Just make sure if we're putting something in that we at least have it located in a spot that we're not going to have to remove it if we. Or, or you know replace it and move it if we end up putting a roundabout there you know I know the crossing kind of went through the island the pedestrian crossing so it would just kind of be off so I would probably figure in some relocation of sidewalks that might not make sense right now but in the future they might um, and then the only other question I think this is a top priority for us but wondering if you could apply safe routes dollars to a potential road that would go behind the school. Is that something that we could marry? And maybe that's a next year project or something that we could marry with other dollars. I know we've there's been talks with MnDOT about some other dollars that might be available to put infrastructure in behind um, you know, the school. With you know, we've had some contact with people from the school that are interested in maybe looking at something like that. So maybe it's not for this round, but the next round we should really start thinking about putting that oh, together. Oh, you can't use safe routes with school dollars for a road, but there are other there are other uh, programs available. Even what about like sidewalks on the road? S sidewalks we could, but we already used safe routes to school dollars to build a sidewalk out to the middle school. So their argument would be is it's just another route from the school out to the middle school when we've already built sidewalks to them. But like I said, there's there's other programs available that would pay for a large portion of the road. So. Thank you. Anybody else have anything? Um, one other quick yeah. one, if I could please. Um, timeline, application deadline, when might we know for this? Application for the letter of intent is due October 29th. If you basically go to full application, that's due by sometime around the first part of January, full application, and then I think we'll find out in March. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have anything? Thank you, sir. Uh, move on to number three, request for use of border city tax credits. Gertie. Thank you. Border City's tax credits are a powerful tool to allow our businesses to compete with, uh, with businesses in North Dakota, for example, because it's close proximity, and also to be used when there is, uh, when our businesses are being approached by other states to relocate. Uh, a few years ago, we helped Northern Valley Machine by making tax credits available when they expanded and bought the additional building out there. At this point, they are uh, being requested by at least a couple of states to relocate. And when the, we talked about it at the EDA, we'd like to use some of the tax dollars, the uh, tax credit dollars that we have available to us to uh, work with them to help retain them as a business in town. They're a very important business in town, and we'd like to keep them here. Um, it's 
they're seeking relief for three years and we recommend that 120,000 in tax credits be allocated to Northern Valley Machine. We currently have a balance of approximately $565,000 and we are receiving approximately $106,000 of additional credits each year. So we have a healthy balance to be able to do this. Uh, they will retain 68 high paying jobs and they promise to increase that to 71 jobs over the next three years. The EDA recommended approval. Mr. Riepel. Is there any requirement, Paul, that if we give them the three year credit that they have to stay for a period of time after that? Yes, there, the state of Minnesota has clawback requirements. Okay. I believe the contract calls for five years. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? See none. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Number four, consider purchase of a new fixed route bus. Nancy Ellis. Thank you, Council President, Council Members. Um, back in 2019, I applied uh, to receive uh, or replace a, a capital vehicle for the transit system. And um, at such time, it was scheduled for 2020 COVID hit um, with our uh, bus service running kind of half operational um, limited service and then the idea that we weren't sure where we were at, at a budget standpoint trying to save as much money as possible from our mileage uh, we weren't ready to replace that bus um, so the state has moved out that bus replacement to 2022 uh, so therefore, I have to submit an application to receive those funds in 2022, and that's why I'm here today. We have to approve a resolution to accept the contract to uh, purchase the bus and receive state funds. Uh, typically, it's an 80-20 split. They've uh, verbally agreed to do a 90-10. That's what's in the tip. Uh, with a max uh, price of 169,000, so 169 would be what would be our local share. However, uh, the bus that we're purchasing off of the state's procurement is coming in at about 148,000. Um, then we add 4,000 for cameras and about $500, maybe a thousand for striping. Um, so we'll be under that 169. So then, whatever the total comes at, we make a request for funds for 90% and then we put in that 10% and that's already budgeted at 169 in our budget for next year so anybody have any questions Mr. Holmes thank you Mr. President uh, typically how many how many buses does each Grand Forks own or how many do we supply we own four. four we own three and then a replacement and then how many how many buses do we run uh, 13. 13. So we have a large, a full-size bus that runs Route 46, part of that. Then we have one that runs Route 12. We have one bus that's strictly for dial ride so we pick up all of our dial ride large providers, um, options, those types of locations, DAC. And then we have to have one replacement, according to FTA. So we have a replacement bus. So is there any, any of those other three left? We have one that'll probably be due in 2024. So um, we have to do a 10 year capital plan for the state of Minnesota. Um, and one of the buses was purchased with the FTA funds and we still have appropriations available for that. So depending upon, um, you have to have a vehicle inventory and you have to have a, a they call it a TAM plan, a transit asset management plan, and then that goes by useful life, mileage, and number of years. And so that's scheduled out in that as well. So we make sure that we have the funds available. It's either scheduled in our MnDOT contract under our capital plan, or we have FTA dollars available. So we always have funds available to pay for um, a bus. So, so how does the, uh, how does the we do pay maintenance. It's on our operating um, billing. So. Anything else, Bill? Oh, Mr. Johnson. 
Yes, how reliable is that verbal 9010 uh, split? That's pretty nice. It's in the contract. We just have it received at the contract, and it's in our tip. And the tip step is uh, uh, an approved document. So because we don't have the contract, I can't guarantee, but it's already set in all of the state documents. So oh, Sounds good to me, Nance. So I'm... It, un unless something happens in the next three days, I would assume it would be a 90-10, so. Good. Anybody else have anything? See none, ma'am. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Number five, discussion on potential changes to special event process. Ms. Nelson. last few years um, we've had a few more events taking place that are a little bit more elaborate require a little bit more from staff um, and it's something that staff has kind of talked about um, and they've already put stuff together to kind of know what costs are going to be um, but we've always used the same special event application for a variety of events a lot of our events take place in the greenway and don't require a lot from the from city staff um, but again there are some that are requiring more and more from us we've always um, since I've been here have been under the understanding that are operated under the fact that if, if city assistance is required the fee is $50 if no city assistance is required then there is no fee for the event to take place and a big part of that was we didn't want fees to be a hindrance and we wanted events to take place within the city so um, as staff, I met with department heads and we kind of discussed special events and how we would like to see them run and when we would like to see applications turned in. Um, I did prepare a new special event application kind of as a template. Um, staff reviewed it and something that <coughs> council may not know is depending on where it takes place, we might not need to get the sheriff's department involved when it deals with the water. We might need to get MnDOT involved depending on what streets they want to close down. We might need to get the DNR involved if they want to use campground property. So um, what staff would like to see is even if nothing else changes, have have these turned in 30 to 60 days before an event staff can review it um, especially for people who have never put on events before which um, the guys think of things differently than I do so I'm glad we had the meeting where um, you know public works can understand how many barricades are needed might know of other streets or areas that need to be blocked off that somebody might not think about you know getting our um, traffic control plan put together sort of a thing so um, we want if applications 30 to 60 days before an event staff can review it and then if we can start charging for services um, there was that included in the packet as well kind of a breakdown of what different things could cost we could come back to the group organization and say this is what you know the requirements would be and this is what the cost would be this is very similar to actually what Grand Forks does. They don't charge for applications to come in. We don't charge for applications to come in, but they do charge for their services. So um, that by no means is this everything, um, but this was just kind of some of the things that had been put together to give you guys an example of what costs might be. So I guess with that, we would just like direction. Is this something that the council would like to start doing? We can try and get things in place by, you know, starting in 2022 and then move forward from there. So what would, I guess I'll take questions, comments, concerns. What would you guys like to see? I think you and I have talked about this and I, I think it's a great idea. We went back and take a look at these things and find out actually what, how much time is spent, not a just, you know, manpower, um, especially with all the, different and departments that are get involved in an event um, could be you know days before or the day after or whatever time period it could be but I think we need to make sure that we're covering what it costs us to help set up or whatever it is manpower for the police department if they have to be on at an event um, I think that's something that we need to be cognizant of and make sure we're planning for it. But also this will, is going to help us make sure the event is successful of making sure these applications get turned in prior so that we can plan. They can plan for it. They know this is going to be out there, let's say whatever 
we get approved or decide what we want to do, this can be given to everybody now and get, let them know what for the 22 season events they want to plan so that they can put it into their budget and if they charge for their event, they can adjust what they charge for the event to make sure they're covering the costs that they have to incur also. Um, so I, I think that we need to do that because you take a look at some of the events, my cost is five to six, seven thousand dollars, you know, and the, all the citizens are paying for that then. So we have to remember that it's not just that person, that business doing this event and the costs they get spread are out, we're all paying for it. So. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I like what you've done so far. I, um, I think Mark hit it on the head that you know, it's something we've talked about recently and kind of going back further, like it's formalizing this process. A couple of the questions I have is, you know, in the, on the second page of the thing where it kind of lists the, you know, does this, yes or no, does this, is there a point and this might be just on a policy side on our side is what's the point in which we have you know the police chief or whoever start looking at what are the safety requirements you know because it doesn't really have anything so, here but. yes so that was something that we talked about in um a, a security plan is something so that 30 to 60 days for yep. staff to review um the security plan chief would look at all of them or someone within the police department would look at all of them and say this is what we're going to require okay. you know how many people are you going to have in attendance if you're going to need police officers that's one thing that is not included on here i know chief was working on putting some um, figures together to you know what would staff time cost so that is something that is being worked on um, so he would look at you know security plan what would be required another thing that would also be looked at is a medical plan um, especially for like uh, the event that comes to mind is the Ufta mud run that we used to hold we had an ambulance on site uh, it, Yep. They kind of went back and forth. Um, so it will be taken on a case by case basis. It might be as simple as, you know, do you have a first aid kit? You know, if it's right. a 5K walk yep. run, where's your first aid kit? Or um, I know Chief would like to know, do you want ambulance on standby? Or, you know, should we be on standby? Do you want us on scene? So those are all things that staff would be looking at. Um, and and again they look at things a little bit differently so it again would be taken by a case by case basis and i would and i like the making sure that you know the 30 or 60 days is is good on their end i think we should set an internal policy of what our response time should be okay. whether that's i mean to me if you're trying to do something big like mm -hmm. yeah they could turn it in 30 days well if we take two weeks to respond like that's a that's a it could be depending on what we're requiring it could be a pretty big lift for them hopefully if they're planning on something they already anticipate some of this but we know that sometimes these things kind of just come up so I would have make sure that we have some sort of internal policy on what our response time should be and or is required so that we can get things back um, if that means that we had to push that back out a little bit to make it right but I would have that conversation to make sure that I mean, we want to be responsive to um, to the people coming in, too. Yep. Um, Absolutely. And then just knowing, it seems like this event thing, or this special event application is primarily geared towards outside events, while it could be used, like, for something inside of a building. But I think we should also, you know, tie this to you know, some of our facility rentals, knowing if we're going to keep going down the path of upgrading some of these facilities, potentially some of this stuff is going to be married to what our rental policies are in some of these city-owned buildings. And I just want to make sure that we we marry those two applications together so that we're, we're not replicating... Um, replicating effort, I guess. Um, I know right now a lot of the times when we do inside, we have our... Uh, facility use agreement that we've been using right. but we can right. definitely put some together to right because you could see yep. I mean in the past I, I always go back to we used to have like MMA um, fights or whatever at the Civic Center like to me that's yeah we have our facility plan or facility agreement but this is that's also a special event because it it deals with traffic and all that stuff I even think you know if we're bringing in 
you know, a tournament, you know, big tournaments, maybe we should start thinking about how we're going to do that and, you know, making sure at a minimum it creates someone that's a responsible party when we do these things so that you have someone to go to and, and all those type of things. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, I think it's a good deal. I think we, oh, the other thing was um, not only having it at the point here at City Hall or with our facilities or anything, I mean, I would say once we get this formalized, maybe it's a good idea to push this out to the CVB or, or you know, make sure that they have it on hand so if, as they're looking for bigger events, they know what would be required at East Grand Forks as well. Okay. So Absolutely. Thank you. I, I don't like the 30 to 60. I'd rather see just a 60 day okay. to give you more ample time to, to get this organized because they know most of these events in advance, far enough in advance. They can, we can do a 60 day. 30 day gets a little tight. Again, your response time will determine that too. So, one thing on that is, you know, we have this timeline: 60 days, whatever it may be. But also, when stuff needs to be turned in, that for the event to happen, actually. So that I don't know if that lines up with your 60 days, or if 60 days application, everything has to be there at that time, whatever's on that list. Or are you thinking the application has to be put in? for approval and then there's another timeline i think there's no that's i want to make sure that's clarified in there yeah so everything has to be turned in you know we want everything you know as complete as possible or as you know what they think they need turn that into staff staff can say this is what we want or this is what would be required mm -hmm. and then once everything's been okay then bring it to council for yeah. approval okay i think it would be nice too if you know, we do have the capability of doing like the, the fill in forms where let's say if it's an event, another set of windows opened up that these are the requirements. Um, so let's say it's by the river, the sheriff thing would pop in and you wouldn't be able to save or send that form in until that's filled in, you yeah. know, or information. So I think getting that form like that online mm -hmm. where it's fillable and then if you select something, different criteria gets pops in on the bottom or wherever it may fill in and that they are highlighted and you can't do anything with that form until that section's done too. So let's say there's a requirement for security or whatever it may be. So I think it's like that we need to look at to make it easier for them to fill it out and then sending it in to you then then having to go back to them, you know, numerous times, say, no, you need to make sure this is filled in here. As long as they have to fill it in and it can't be submitted until everything's done. That's, I think that's the route to go to make it easier. Okay. Mayor Gander. So uh, Megan, I like the way that this is going. Um, I like that you've taken a look at what neighboring communities are doing because we do want to make sure we stay competitive for attracting these events to our community versus not. Um, I know that this is for information so far and that you'll plan to bring back more of a final version of an application when we get a little bit closer. Um, one, one little concern I had, one in my mind where I was okay having the city fund some of these is that you know all the businesses in a district really do benefit when there's a big event, let's say in our downtown, all the businesses benefit. And so to spread the cost seems fair and then we came to realize that they all pay into the CVB and the CVB pays out a good bit for bringing these events to town. So even that concern as for the hotel, hotels benefit, the restaurants, the movie theaters, anybody who pays into the CVB and they turn around and make a generous contribution, you know they're active in supporting all these things that come to town. That kind of washes that out a little bit. And then on the city side, so many of the costs are actually above and beyond our normal operation. You may have officers that work overtime, you may have public works that work overtime. And so really do, we do have additional costs above and beyond our normal. And that's really all we're trying to do is just recoup those. So this makes a lot of sense. And um, I like the direction we're going. Thanks. Mr. Norris. Thank you, Mr. President. Just one additional thing. And I don't, I might be retracing on some of what I've said before. I do like that we've, we're trying to formalize this process and make it transparent and you know, streamlined and also accomplish what we need to do. Um, but 
I, my own internal like fear is we don't want to become too rigid either. You know, this does cover demonstrations. A couple years ago, we had a demonstration out in front of the city hall that basically formed in hours. You know, so and. It, this is for our benefit too. We want to be able to know what's happening. We want to be able to have the right security in place. We want to have those type of things too. So I, I mean, while this is what are preferred, and I get like the 60 day or whatever, but two months planning on big events, real big events, makes sense. But sometimes these are just small block parties, you know, or whatever. And these people are just, you know, they don't go through the process of trying to figure, you know two months out that they're going to have a block party and they want to shut down their street or something well, like that. So actually, I want to have at least some, make sure that staff and people are willing to make, a, you know. Yeah. We understand that there's going to be a period where, you know, people are going to need to, we'll have to educate and make sure people understand kind of the process, like if we change this process, what it will be. Block parties, on the other hand, are a separate application altogether. Right. So we don't have to worry about I that. Know. We but went through that a it, while ago. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but no, it's, it, we totally understand that there's going to be a learning curve to this and we'll try and, you know, get the information out the best we can. And yes, obviously we will work with people and organizations and, you know, try and um, get through and, and like I said, a lot, a lot of things, you know, the smaller things are taking place in the Greenway or the 5K, 10K races and stuff like that. And that doesn't take much. Those, you know, we have our annual events that do take place. Um, this is like, I just think of um, the Grand Forks Marathon. I know they changed their route this last time, but we used to put, you know, the guys would put out a lot of barricades and a lot of cones and all that kind of stuff too. So um, it's it's definitely, you know, if we're going to be hosting stuff like that, we definitely want to just make sure our bases are covered. And I, I'll say it again, I think people they need to understand that we want to make sure these events are successful and we can do everything we can to make sure we do that. I think them working with us and us working with them is the best way we can get these things run smoothly and off without a hitch and if we're under the gun and trying to get stuff approved for them, sometimes that's going can be a hindrance and we don't want that. So. Mayor, you have one last thought? One last question. thing that's come up um, even on facilities use. Um, we may want to discuss the distinction between for-profit and non-profit. That's it? Uh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Well, Megan, you're a good employee and you're good to talk to on the phone. I think that uh, you're doing a great job and appreciate your expertise on this. I think that the smoother we can make it for people, the better. Thank you. Mr. Better. Thank you, Mr. President. Just want to clarify the section with the payloader and grader, that's the hourly rate for that piece of equipment. And then there's an, also an hourly rate for one of our employees to operate it. They're not going to be able to just rent the grader and come out to the city shop and take it and drive away with it. Correct. Yeah. Um, it's, and actually, if I, um, the equipment actually includes somebody operating it. Mm -hmm. So the, the cost of the equipment includes somebody operating it. So if an employee needs to come in and maybe do something else to cover their time, um, it, if it's not operating equipment, it might be, you know, we could charge for their time. But no, the equipment is not something that we'll just let anybody rent. <laughs> but that, uh, that, like the payloader is $45, that includes an operator? Yes. Okay, so we might want to specify that on okay. each of those lines. That includes the operator. Okay, so. absolutely. Yeah, that's a good deal. Can, can you, do you hire out to <laughs> some project? <laughs> I, was to say, I think we, really we might need some foot payload or use. <laughs> if, I can get, if I can get some hours on 45 bucks an hour, I'll take it. Anybody else have any questions for Megan? I don't know who to ask. Uh, I see none, Megan. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. Okay. Good. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Johnson. Second by Holmes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. The motion is carried. Means adjourned. Yeah, next time.